to Comrades in Farms here on True Frequency Radio, iHeart, tuned in, talk stream live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. That's F A R M A C Y, as in let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. We got a little bit of a snowstorm going on today. Not a very large one, forecasted to be about three inches. I'd say we're just about there, and the snowstorm is supposed to let off in the next couple hours. Uh, but I just thought I would share this. Uh, here on the show, Comrades in Farms, I rarely do any outside stuff because I'm usually in studio for the recording of this and I usually have guests on via Skype or something. I'm doing the show solo today and so I just want to provide a little bit of perspective here outside before we go inside and talk a little bit more about uh, some recent shows that I've done on Comrades in Farms and how and why they tie in to regenerative agriculture and farming and nutrition and human health and some of those other pieces. Um, there's a lot I want to cover on the show today. I don't have any guests today, so it's going to be me solo. So you're going to have to uh, bear, me, bear with me while I blabber on, so to speak. I hope you'll find what I have to say interesting or informative, or that it'll change your perspective about things a little bit. But uh, I just thought I would get a shot of this beautiful scenery with the snow out here today. I hope, uh, hope you can see that and enjoy it. And if you're listening on Truth Frequency Radio, I uh, encourage you to come back and have a, a view of the show uh, in video format here on YouTube. Uh, my understanding is Truth Frequency Radio is supposed to add video to our station at some point, although I don't know when that'll be. But uh, when it does, of course, uh, we'll be broadcasting also on Truth Frequency Radio in video. Until then, let's go take a little walk inside the greenhouse and uh, give you a little bit of a tour. So here we are, headed in from the snow outside. I started the stove back up in here, oh, I don't know, maybe one o'clock or so. And uh, I guess I'll just give a quick tour in here while we're in here. Uh, you can see things are not uh, in super green growth mode at the moment. We've been in low light for several months now with the winter season on. And so things aren't growing quite as fast as they usually are in here due to low light. And also uh, I've uh, had some chainsaw issues recently. And so the, uh, the fuel consumption, I've turned that down a bit. I've been able to do that much more effectively with the new insulation and wood chip that I put in place this fall. That's helped tremendously in maintaining temperatures more stable and, uh, and nice in here. Uh, also I put in the thermal mass system with the two thermal mass reserve barrels as well as a coil underneath this bed here and that helps keep things stable and warm and has definitely helped with plant comfort this year. Uh, another issue here is uh, I'm out of water and it's been very cold for a long time and so I've been unable to run the ram pump in order to refill water tanks. So in order to refill water tanks I've been pulling from these reserve barrels that I had here. Those are nearly empty now and so I've been actually pulling snow in and uh, dumping it into the thermal mass tanks in the water refill tank and warming it up with the wood stove which fortunately is super effective for heating it back up but it definitely takes a lot of BTUs to go from ice to uh, warm water. In the meantime uh, the greenhouse temperature control system has been stable for several months now since I uh, upgraded to the solid state hard drive 100 gigabyte solid state hard drive high speed 3.0 USB we're running a Raspberry Pi 4 with 4 gigs of RAM that's a quad core 1.5 gigahertz processor so Pretty robust processor running uh, Raspbian and Stretch on it, latest updates in firmware. Um, so uh, we're charting, we're collecting data. My friend Brian from Easy Data Does It, who's been on as a guest a couple times, has been playing with the data and talking about how to manage and visualize that data better and how to use that data more effectively for a better understanding of things. We're going to get into that a lot more as this year goes on and into next year. Uh, Brian and I have been coordinating in the background on lots of projects and we're going to bring a whole lot more information to the channel, uh, to this channel, in regards to that and also to Brian's channel on Easy Data Does It on YouTube. And also check out his website, easydatadoesit.org. Um, Brian's doing all sorts of awesome tutorials on data science. Brian's getting his master's in data science and has worked in data science for over 10 years with a major, major institution here in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to give away what the institution is. Brian wants to keep some anonymity and privacy for his home and family life. Uh, so that said, uh, this has been sort of just a quick update tour in the greenhouse. I thought I would start the show out with that because uh, we've sort of uh, <laughs> moved away from the agricultural subject a bit 
in uh, recent shows and uh, I don't want people to think that I've just completely abandoned agriculture. I have not. I'm going to continue to do videos about agriculture, but um, I'm going to get into that a little bit more when I get inside. I'm going to discuss a little bit more about why I've kind of strayed off to some of these other topics. They may not seem related to agriculture, but they are very much related to agriculture, and I'm going to go ahead and tie that back in for you when I get inside. Okay, so here we are back in the studio. Uh, hope you appreciate the snow out there and a uh, little shot of the greenhouse. It really is beautiful out there and uh, um, I'm glad to be able to share that with you. Uh, the snow can be quite daunting if you live in New York and have to deal with cleaning it up every time it snows. We've had quite a few storms recently so uh, uh, it can be a little frustrating, but uh, I've got a little bit of uh, more of a glimmer in my life these days that uh, helps me shine through those storm, snowstorms a little bit better and actually appreciate their beauty a little more. So it's kind of a nice, uh, nice change of perspective. Anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why uh, on my channel here and Comrades and Farms we're talking so much about data science and amateur radio and some of these other pieces that may seem completely unrelated to uh, to farming and agriculture in general. Um, I think I want to share something that my dad sent to me uh, yesterday. I think, and it's a little bit of a little bit of a perspective twister. Uh, even for me, even though I'm aware of this sort of stuff, it was uh, it was a good way to rehash and rethink and reshift my perspective on life and things and how fast things evolve. So um, the title of the email that he sent is if you were born 1930 to 1946. It says hope you enjoy a little history. Special group born between 1930 and 1946. Today they range in ages from 75 to 90. Are you or do you know someone still here? Interesting facts for you. You are the smallest group of children born since the early 1900s. You are the last generation climbing out of the depression who can remember the winds of war and the impact of a world war at which a world war which rattled the structure of our daily lives for years. You are the last to remember ration books for everything from gas to sugar to shoes to stoves. You saved tinfoil and poured fat into tin cans. You saw, you saw cars up on blocks because tires weren't available. You can remember milk being delivered to your house early in the morning and placed in the milk box on the porch. You were the last to see gold stars in the front of windows of grieving neighbors whose sons died in the war. You saw the boys, home from the war, build their little houses. You were the last generation who spent childhood without television. Instead, you imagined what you heard on the radio. With no TV until the 50s, you spent your childhood playing outside. There was no Little League. There was no city playground for kids. The lack of television in your early years meant that you had little that you had little real understanding of the, what the world was like. On Saturday afternoons, the movies gave newsreels sandwiched between westerns and cartoons. Telephones were, were one to a house, often shared party lines, and hung on the wall in the kitchen, with no cares about privacy. Computers were called calculators. They were hand-cranked. Typewriters were driven by pounding fingers, throwing the carriage and changing the ribbon. Internet and Google words that did not exist. Newspapers and magazines were written for adults, and the news was broadcast on your radio in the evening. As you grew up, the country was exploding with growth. The government gave returning veterans a means to get an education and spurred colleges to grow. Loans fanned a housing boom. Pent-up demand coupled with new installment payment plans opened many factories for work. New highways would bring jobs and mobility. The veterans joined civic clubs and became active in politics. The radio network expanded from three stations to thousands. Your parents were suddenly free from the confines of depression and the war, and they threw themselves into exploring opportunities they had never imagined. You weren't neglected, but you weren't today's all-consuming family focus. They were glad you played by yourselves until the streetlights came on. They were bus busy discovering the post-war world, post world. You went to a world of overflowing plenty and opportunity. A world where you were welcomed and enjoyed yourselves and felt secure in your future, though depression and poverty was deeply remembered. Polio was still a, cripper, a crippler. 
You came of age in the 50s and 60s. You're the last generation to experience an interlude when there was no threats to our homeland. The Second World War was over, and the Cold War, terrorism, global warming, and perpetual economic insecurity had yet to haunt life with unease. Only your generation can remember both the time of great war and a time when our world was secure and full of bright promise and plenty. You grew up at the best possible time, at a time when the world was getting better. You are the last ones. More than 99% of you were either retired or deceased, and you feel privileged to have lived in the best of times. So that kind of ties into why uh, I've been doing all these other pieces that may be seemingly so far removed from agriculture. I think as humans we really have a failure to understand how quickly our world is changing around us and um, and to understand how fast that really happens we're sort of immersed in our daily lives and we sort of don't notice that things are changing around us as fast as they are uh, even for me um, I'm very well immersed in technology as you might know through my YouTube channel through my truth frequency radio show and all the other technological pieces I do. I do a lot of stuff with Raspberry Pi. I write my own code. I develop my own hardware and software. Um, I play around with amateur radio, all sorts of it, everything from HF radio to building my own antennas to VHF radio to DMR or digital mobile radio. And even though I'm immersed in these technologies so heavily, um, it really blows my mind when I look back 10 years ago and I realize how much smaller hard drives were even or how different cell phones were. Um, I just recently got a cell phone again, and uh, the last time I had a cell phone was like 2010, and uh, it was a flip phone. It was a pretty straightforward phone. Texting was pretty awkward to do still. Uh, my new phone today is a Moto E, and it's an Android-powered phone, and has touchscreen and runs all sorts of apps at actually pretty incredible speeds for a phone. I'm very impressed by what it can do. And so this all ties into what is the future of agriculture? Where is our world going as far as farming, food supply systems, all these other pieces? Uh, even in the last year with the COVID thing, we've seen tremendous changes in food supply chains and how food is handled and delivered and processed and how quick turnaround, turnaround times are. Um, just so many pieces that have changed so dramatically in such a short period of time. Uh, so I think it's good to keep all this sort of stuff in perspective as we go forward. And part of that is, what is the world we're going into in the future? Well, already commercially, uh, big agricultural systems are adopting robotic systems. They're using robots for everything from weed control to targeted fertilizer, targeted pesticides, uh, uh, harvesting, on down the list. And uh, that world is changing dramatically and dynamically in a way that uh, you're probably not aware of yet. Or if you are, you probably only understand really the cutting edge of it. Um, in the next 10 to 15 years, most of large-scale agricultural will be roboticized. There will be a lot less labor, uh, you know, normal farm labor in use in those systems. That will dramatically change the economic scale of it and it will dramatically change how our food comes to us, the quality of our food, hopefully, and uh, many other uh, small important pieces with that. So why do I go into data science and amateur radio and all this other sort of seemingly non-connected stuff? Well, data science is a terrific way to analyze what's going on and to collect information about all sorts of systems, especially farming systems from my perspective, and to better understand how those farming systems can be improved, made more efficient, what's going on in the system, and to better visualize and understand the data presented to us. My friend Brian Sika, when he was on, was talking about um, the, uh, uh, the human inability to visualize or understand data. And he gave a few examples of it. And if you haven't seen those shows where he was on, he was on twice, uh, you should go back and check them out. Brian uh, provided some really interesting insight on data science and data visualization. And while some of that stuff might sound sort of boring to you if you're not familiar with it or interested in it, it is very relevant of the future that's in front of us. John Kempf gave a talk at the Soil Nutrition Conference in 2018 on the future of agriculture. If you haven't heard that talk, I'll uh, try to provide a link here on the YouTube channel, and I highly, highly encourage you to go check that out and have a listen to it. 
it will completely change your perspective on what the future of agriculture holds for us. Um, right now, most of the agricultural food supply chains come through uh, major markets or they come through uh, uh, CSAs, uh, also known as Community Supported Agriculture. A lot of those are, uh, you know, pick them up at a certain drop spot, that kind of thing. That's changing. Uh, there is a service coming soon, uh, if it's not already in play in some places, uh, sort of like, uh, um, what's the name of, uh, uh, oh, pardon me, I'm having a, uh, a brain moment here. <laughs> Uh, uh, Uber, uh, sort of like Uber, but uh, for food, where you can actually, uh, you know, basically order food from local suppliers, local small farms, and have it delivered right to your house. Uh, it probably will be a little bit more expensive initially, but as those systems get more refined and as data science helps provide the data to make that refinement more efficient, more productive, and um, more quick and um, capable of pivoting with shifting food supplies and shifting demands uh, the price of that will come down and uh, that will provide some excellent opportunities for small farmers who uh, who right now have to compete with big ag and big supermarkets uh, I've done some small farming stuff myself I've done some limited sales to local restaurants and stuff and I can tell you that trying to align uh, harvest times, ripeness times, and demand times from uh, customers is really tricky on a small scale. I imagine it's even more difficult on a big scale. Uh, you don't want the food going bad that you spent months and months growing. You want to get it right to where you're trying to deliver it to. That can be really tricky. And so uh, having other flexible options for marketing and flexible ways to deliver it that don't require your time to go out and deliver it or drive it to a drop site uh, will help that dramatically. Uh, as we go forward in time here, technology is becoming cheaper and cheaper and available to more and more people. Uh, that will provide tremendous benefit for uh, small farms and small scale operations. Right now, they are up against a wall, sort of. Um, they still have all the labor cost of running small farms. They don't have the big machinery and the big robotics and the big harvesting systems that large scale farming systems have. And so that's an even harder competitive edge to work against. Um, but as we go forward, I think that the technology, as it trickles down and becomes more available on smaller scales, and people like me and others continue to develop that technology for small scale systems, uh, that'll help level the playing field back out. And it'll help make our farming systems more resilient to uh, climate change and uh, things like COVID and all sorts of other disruptions in supply chain and disruptions in uh, normal uh, daily life, so to speak. Uh, a lot of these uh, little things come along can cause such a glitch that uh, you know farmers lose a tremendous amount of money. We saw that back in the spring with farmers having to uh, kill off large amounts of cattle and chickens and basically having to throw away many months worth of work, a lot of feed time and energy time into growing those products and then have to throw them away. That is a very discouraging thing to go through as a farmer. Um, and along those lines, I want to say, you know, uh, I know that there's a common uh, thought that farmers are kind of stupid people or that they're not that intelligent. I have to say, some of the farmers I've met are some of the most intelligent people I've met. And part of that, I think, is that they're very, uh, very thoughtful and they have different perspectives on things. They try to consider all perspectives of things. And that can be... Uh, that can really open your mind up to understanding things on a wider scale. And that is part of why I am bringing data science, amateur radio, and uh, people like Tom Seward and all these other perspectives into my show here and uh, trying to provide you uh, another viewpoint or perspective or angle on things to help you uh, better understand how all these things that are seemingly disconnected actually tie together in uh, some very meaningful ways, although they may, they may seem um, quite far apart. So I just wanted to uh, kind of introduce this concept to people and kind of help uh, tie all this stuff back together because uh, I was afraid that people might start to think that I just kind of wandered away from agriculture. And rest assured, I've not wandered away from agriculture. I really just want to span the spectrum and I want to share that with you and I want to help provide a wider perspective for you so you can better understand 
uh, all the pieces that are really involved in this. And I know uh, some of these uh, topics might seem kind of boring or a little bit more complex than someone who's just looking for uh, simple answers about farming, but um, it's uh, it's hard to tie all those pieces together in one show or one general concept. So I'm kind of spanning across multiple shows, and I hope you'll bear with me and kind of uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> kind of follow along as we go and I hope that it'll help uh, open your mind up to a different way of seeing things and a different and broader understanding of things. So um, in the next part of the show I want to go into uh, Mr. John Kempf's book. John Kempf is the founder of Advancy Eco Agriculture. He started that company in 2006 and John grew up on a conventional farm in Ohio, his uh, father's farm and his father was not only one of the big farms in the area but also uh, their farm was one of the biggest uh, pesticide distributors in the area and so John grew up with the conventional farming system and he grew up uh, working with those systems and not realizing the negative effects that uh, pesticides, fertilizers, all these chemical inputs and this uh, killing life mentality or trying to kill out certain things from farming systems mentality not realizing the impact of that until later on. Uh, at one point, his father's farm, or their farm, had taken over a section of the neighboring property next to him that had not been farmed in several years, and they planted the way they were planting the fields. They planted right straight across from their farm onto the what was previously fallow land, and when they did so, they noticed a tremendous gain in plant health on the stuff that had not been planted in the conventional pesticide system. And so that was sort of the turning point for John where he realized that um, some of the things that they were doing might not be so beneficial. He actually spent a lot of time observing and noticing that plants right next to each other across this very definitive line between the fallow field and the, uh, the fields that they had had in production for a number of years he actually noticed a difference in the plant health in a very small scale, a couple of feet. He could see, you know, plants that were dying of powdery mildew on one side of the line and the other side, right next to it, plants that were perfectly healthy. And these plants had all been treated the same nutritionally uh, from the start of the season. They had all been transplanted from the same uh, lots. You know, nothing else was different except the soil that were planted in. And so that's what really turned John on to trying to understand the difference between the two. And ultimately, that led John to go and form the company Advancing Eco Agriculture. If you have not checked their channel out, go check it out on YouTube. It's Advancing Eco Agriculture. And uh, I'll try to provide a link in the description for the show here, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe I'll put a card link here in the video. Um, but John does a whole bunch of awesome webinars on plant health and human health and nutrition. He's interviewed lots of really excellent and knowledgeable people that have been farming for a long time and they really have a clear and concise understanding of healthy farming systems and they have a lot of awesome perspective to share. So if you haven't uh, heard anything from John's channel, go check that out. Uh, they also have a website, Advancing Eco Agriculture dot com or advancing eco ag dot com uh, again I'll put a link in the description of the video here so you can go check it out they sell all sorts of products uh, that are not pesticides or chemicals they are actually plant enhancing products uh, most of them are used in foliar feed or soil amendments um, if you look back through my channel you'll see that I use foliar feeds targeted foliar feeds to do most of my nutritional work here um, I have not put a lot of investment into building soils, although I should be doing those two in conjunction. I just found that foliar feeds were a more efficient and easier way to do it, and that they have much, much, much tremendous more gain per amount that you put on. And when you put targeted foliar feeds onto plants, that accelerates that plant's health. In accelerating that plant's health, you accelerate photosynthesis because now you have balanced nutrition. And when you do that, that photosynthesis makes that plant's energy much, much higher, much, much higher. And when that plant has excess energy, it sends that excess energy in the form of exudates 
down into the soil and into the root system and that feeds the microbes in the soil and in feeding those microbes in the soil they go out and unlock more nutrients and they send those nutrients back to the plants so this is a symbiotic process this is going on all the time and when you have truly healthy plants really really high energy about 80 percent of the energy that they produce from sunlight can be sent to the soil to feed the soil microbiology and that accelerates the plant's health so uh, there's sort of two different approaches you can like build the soil by itself and that's a slow process or you can build the soil um, using foliar feeds which is a much faster process but uh, it doesn't last as long in other words you'd have to foliar feed every 7 to 14 days whereas if you put a soil amendment down a soil amendment could last you know for months or even years depending on the amendment and the usage of it and the quantity um, but when you pair those two together and you're building soils and you're building plant health the soils help accelerate the, uh, the plants help accelerate the soil health and the soil health helps accelerate the plant health so you put those two in tandem and you start to have what's called synergy synergy and when you start to do synergistic stacks like that especially when you combine microbiology and uh, certain uh, enzymes and um, other biological pieces of the system including fungi you start to really get this really tremendous acceleration I've seen that here on my farm on small scale uh, if you go back and look through some of my videos you can see tremendous changes in soil uh, in comparison between uh, areas where I've worked under foliar feeds and areas that I haven't the soil is shades and shades darker in a very short period of time so I just kind of want to uh, bring that out to people. What I'm going to do in the next section here, I have John's book. Uh, it's called Quality Agriculture, and it's conversations about regenerative ag agronomy with innovative scientists and growers. Uh, this is volume one by John Kempf. It's available on Amazon. Um, I highly recommend you pick it up. And I highly recommend you check out all sorts of other information from John. You can hear stuff on his channel, and you can hear stuff uh, where John is uh, interviewed in, uh, and where he does uh, talks on uh, the Soil Nutrition Conference. Anyway, I'm going to uh, read a few excerpts from that in this next section, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. I think you'll find it very interesting. With that, we're coming up on the break here. You're listening to Truth Frequency Radio. You're listening to Comrades and Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio on iHeart, tuned in, talk stream live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network. We'll catch you on the other side of the break.
to Comrades in Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, TalkStream Live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, as in let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Tonight we're talking a little bit about regenerative agriculture and how it relates to all sorts of other complex systems. But I also wanted to kind of uh, rope things back into regenerative agriculture and provide a little bit more detail and perspective along those lines. In a little bit, I'm going to read a few excerpts here from John Kemp's book, Quality Agriculture. And uh, by the way, I should mention I've uh, gotten John to agree at least tentatively to come on my show here, Comrades in Farms, in March. I'm very honored to have John coming on as a guest, and I know you will be blown away with everything that man has to say. He has a tremendous amount of knowledge, and he's an excellent speaker and really good at sharing ideas and perspectives. So I hope you'll tune in for that episode. I don't have a date pinned down on that yet, but uh, you know we touched base and he agreed to come on. And I know John is a man of his word, so if he's agreed to come on, I'm sure he will. Um, so I hope you look forward to that. Right, pardon my little break there. I had a little bit of a sneezing fit come on and I uh, didn't want to expose you to it. So uh, I'm going to roll back from talking about John Kemp for a little bit and kind of share with you uh, how I came to be doing a show here on Truth Through Cancer Radio and YouTube called Comrades and Farms. So let's roll back to my background a little bit. On my mother's side, my great-grandfather and my grandfather both were farmers. My great-grandfather farmed uh, out in western New York and uh, several other places I understand also. I actually uh, intend to dig back into the family history notes a little bit and share some of those at some point on the show because some of that stuff is really interesting perspective from uh, decades and decades and decades before uh, conventional farming systems today. Anyway, so that's in my background, and not only in my background, but in my genetics as well. So uh, I grew up in a little town called Red Hook, New York, and my family had property out in a town called Delhi, New York, and Delhi was actually the old family farm. And so it was this piece of property on the side of a mountain called Scotch Mountain. It was very beautiful out there. And uh, so I grew up, we would go out there uh, weekends and summers and spend time uh, hunting and fishing and cutting firewood and making maple sap and uh, all sorts of interesting stuff very close to nature and uh, very uh, tied into uh, natural ecosystems. Uh, one of the things we had on the farm there we had a couple of uh, ponds and trout ponds uh, and they were actually stock ponds that we stocked. Both of those ponds were spring fed from springs that came down on the mountain up in Delhi. And uh, the, the upper part of those springs actually went into a tank and down through a line and actually fed water to the house that provided pressured water to the house. We had about 21 pounds of pressure off a of direct fed gravity from a spring. And I can still taste that water in my head today from that spring. That spring water was the softest, sweetest, most delicious water. If you ever get a chance to have spring water from the Catskill Mountains, uh, you will not regret it. It is really beautiful, excellent stuff. And there's actually a spring that I still go to occasionally up on 214 up near Hunter. And uh, that spring is right along the side of the road. It just gushes out of there with pure, fresh mountain spring water. And uh, when I would go up and get that water, man, uh, the flush out that you would have, the health burst that you would have, and just uh, when you drink that water, you just got this wonderful, clean, healthy, happy feeling from it. For those who don't know, I've done some pretty extensive study on water. I was on the Paranormal Portal as a guest where we talked about health and spirituality and also uh, water and spirituality. And I tied into many of these other uh, things that I've uh, studied over time about water, including Dr. Masaru Emoto, Dr. Gerald Pollack, Victor Schauberger, and on down the list of really interesting people who understood water on a level way, way, way above what we commonly think of as just water today. Water actually has memory to it and it can impart that memory and, um, and that, uh, that energetic signer, signature to the plants, animals, and humans that it comes in contact with. And it can also pick up those energies from the plants, animals, and humans it comes in contact with. Anyway, so springs all over that mountain. Springs fed the breeder ponds, springs fed the house, and we had another uh, family farm. 
Anyway, we had another family farm that was uh, about four or five miles away from there. That was called the Ruff Farm. And that was because uh, the Ruff family used to own that property back when it was a homestead. Uh, when we had it, there were never any buildings on it. It was just raw, barren property, with the exception of a gigantic spring cistern that I would have to imagine that spring produced probably 100 gallons a minute of the coldest, purest, freshest spring water you can imagine. Well, coming out of that spring box, we had two four-inch pipes, and they went into a pond that we had had dug, and well, my grandfather had had dug many years back as a breeder pond for breeding trout. And so one of those pipes went to the bottom of the pond and fed fresh water to the pond. There was an overflow in the pond, so there was a constant fresh flow of spring, cold, cold spring water into the pond. And uh, the other pipe went down into a gravel bed that had been built in this pond. This pond was set up with a gigantic drain pipe and valve. So the, the cold water going into that spring feed bed actually uh, boiled that spring cold spring water up through the gravel bed and that's where the trout would breed and that was their breeder bed they would spawn in the gravel on that bed where that water was ice cold and fresh and uh, they would actually reproduce in this pond and so every year or two we would go in we'd put in screens around the drain and we'd turn the big dump gate on and we'd disconnect the spring water supply from the pond and we'd drain the pond down and we'd go through with nets and we'd catch a bunch of these young trout and we'd transfer them into a transfer tank with an aerator and we drive them over in the truck and distribute them into the two stock ponds. So we had this constant supply of fresh trout that we could go out and fly fish or lure fish or whatever kind of fishing you wanted to do. My grandfather was very big on fly fishing. Um, so we could go out and fish those ponds anytime we wanted, catch a fresh trout, throw it on the frying pan and be eating fresh trout in minutes. Uh, that was a really cool experience and in those ponds there were many tadpoles, there were lilies, there were cattails all over the place, there were frogs. Uh, my friends and I when we were little would go and catch frogs. We would spend all day catching frogs and salamanders and newts in those ponds and it was just endless entertainment and interaction directly with nature and uh, my parents would have to almost literally drag us in from playing to go eat dinner. That's how excited we were to be out in nature and playing with those natural systems. Excuse me. Um, so uh, let's see. So that's the ponds. So uh, that's sort of the farm and the area that I grew up in. That farm also, uh, a big portion of that property ran along the east branch of the Little Delaware River which is a huge trout fishing river in the Catskill Mountains that feeds into the larger Delaware and goes on down through the Delaware Water Gap. Goes down into Pennsylvania and out. Uh, very beautiful stream. The whole route along that stream is gorgeous. If you ever get a chance to fish that or, uh, or even just go explore along it, it is beautiful. Um, so we got a lot of time, we spent trout fishing on that stream, we got to watch those streams evolve uh, and every, uh, every winter when we would be gone from the farm over the winter and we'd come back in the spring, that whole stream bed would have shifted again. The whole rock layout, everything would have been shifted from those spring floods. So it's interesting how dynamic uh, nature is there. Another one of the things we did on this farm up in Delhi was, uh, the, it's called thinning, forest thinning. And basically what you do is you go through and you cut a certain amount of the smaller trees out of the lower canopy of the forest so that the bigger trees have lots of room to develop. And we did this thinning through the forestry service as part of the forestry program, but also with the targeted intent of increasing the productivity of the sugar bush that we had there. So on this property, it's about 81 acres, uh, it was mostly mountain, and most of that mountain of the property went up above the house and above the sap house. We had quite a large sap house there, and uh, let's see, we had uh, I think it was, I think it was a hundred gallon uh, boiler tank set up in there, run by a gigantic, gigantic wood furnace. Uh, you could stick uh, three foot logs in that thing, thirty six inch logs in that. So uh, it was it was quite the setup. Outside there was a thousand, actually it was a pair of one thousand gallon uh, sap reserve tanks. And so uh, those sap reserve tanks would feed right into the evaporator, and the evaporator had channels in it, so you could, as you evaporated, you could take the concentration, the higher concentration of sugar off the evaporator, and then you go to a finishing evaporator and finish off the last little bit of evaporation. The last part of that process is very delicate. 
so uh, you have to really control temperature and evaporation well if you go too low in temperature you don't get syrup you get something that's a little less than syrup and you get uh, you get what's called plum in the bottom of it and it basically it kind of looks like a plum but it's just like this weird uh, condensation of sugar that happens in the bottom of the, the syrup and if you go too far in temperature you end up with something that turns into sugar candy if you've ever had maple candy that's basically maple syrup that was taken to a higher temperature than you would make syrup at. So a uh, very delicate process. Anyway, this whole mountainside was covered in not only hard maple trees, but also other trees and all sorts of diversity, ferns, mosses, just all kinds of beautiful, uh, diverse wildlife and flora and fauna. Uh, anyway, this whole uh, maple sugar stand stood vertically up above the sap house and so we would go up and we would tap these trees and we'd plug them into the plastic lines and we'd run those plastic lines down into junctions into bigger lines and eventually it came in at uh, I think three quarters or one inch line came into those thousand gallon tanks so at night when temperatures drop the sap freezes up it stops flowing and then in the morning when the sun comes out and the temperatures start to rise again that sap starts to flow and so you'll go from virtually no sap moving overnight to this sudden rush and gush of sap in the morning. And so that's why those two big tanks. So you could, you could actually buffer uh, the sap that you're collecting during those rushes into the tanks and then keep boiling on the overnights so you could evaporate off so you could get out ahead of the tanks so that the next morning's rush wouldn't overflow your tanks and end up wasting sap. So for those who don't know, it takes somewhere between 35 and 70 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. That depends largely on the sugar content of the sap, which has uh, a lot of dependencies, including time of season, time of year, whether or not you tapped in the fall and the spring, um, the overnight temperatures, the angle of the sun, whether or not the wind's blowing. There's a lot of really interesting environmental factors that tie into this, and I'm not going to go deep into this right now. I just sort of wanted to touch on it because it's another part of my experience growing up. Um, so anyway, so we would capture all that sap, make maple syrup, we sold the syrup, and uh, that was a really interesting process and experience to be part of, and uh, help help me connect with me with nature on another level. Um, Later on, let's see, uh, oh, we also did uh, some Christmas trees up there. We planted uh, conifers and we would sell Christmas trees up there. Um, and then there were many stands that my uh, grandparents had planted and they had grown up to these ginormous spruce tree stands and they were beautiful too. Um, I don't know, maybe if I can get back on the property sometime, I could take the video camera up and, and get some video of it. But anyway, that experience was part of my farming experience. Now back here in the Hudson Valley, uh, my uh, extended family has a farm. It's actually the Greg farm, and uh, it's right on Pitcher Lane in Red Hook. And uh, they've got berries, uh, berry production, um, all sorts of uh, pumpkins and all sorts of stuff. And they actually have a farm stand there now. And there was a winery there. I'm not sure if the winery is even still there now. But So I grew up uh, picking berries over there, being around those farming systems. Uh, my mom always had a garden. I always helped her in the garden, helped her plant the garden, and that sort of thing. Um, in 1999, uh, my brother died in a car accident, and uh, my girlfriend at the time and I moved into the house that he was living in. That was on a huge farm in Red Hook, and uh, I actually put in a garden. That was the first time I put in my own garden, and I started gardening, and I really fell in love with that. Uh, just prior to that, I had worked for another farm, uh, Hoffman's, Hoffman's Farm in Red Hook, and uh, we actually had grown uh, a pretty large amount of tomatoes and uh, green peppers uh, for one season or maybe two. And when we used that, when we did that, we did all conventional uh, fertilizers and uh, you know chem normal, normal, normal chemical farming mentality. And so, having come from the really natural system worked in that farming system with much less uh, much less natural farming systems using chemical fertilizers stuff like bravo to uh, as a fungicide to control blight uh, you know all that kind of stuff i sort of got into that chemical mindset and so when i planted my first garden uh, i was using roundup uh, to control weeds and stuff around the edges had no idea i had been told it was safe just as mr hoffman had been told it was safe 
and uh, didn't find out till years later just how unsafe it actually is. Um, anyway, so uh, I, I started out from that perspective, and as things went on, I started to notice, uh, you know, when I would use organic uh, fertilizers like cabinor and that kind of stuff, that those sections of the garden would thrive and flourish in a way that the stuff that I was using chemical fertilizers for wouldn't. Um, the chemical fertilizers was, would often provide this big flush of growth initially, and then uh, later in the season, things would start to crash. And then if you tried to add more chemical fertilizer to catch it up, you could never seem to quite get it stabilized and balanced right. And yet the things that I had planted in cow manures and, uh, and soils that weren't uh, treated that way continued to flourish and thrive. And I got all sorts of compliments on the quality and the taste of the vegetables and uh, tomatoes and produce that I was growing. And people were always like, how do you get that flavor? How do you get that flavor? And honestly, I didn't know at the time either. But what I found out since is that it was, you know, all the microbes and the organic chemistry going on in the soil, all those little soil microbial communities that are so important. So uh, I farmed there. I farmed on another farm in Red Hook. <laughs> uh, in 2009, I was laid off as, uh, for a surveyor engineer. And I started, uh, I started farming over on this property actually before I was laid off. And I just kind of transitioned more heavily into that that year and uh, had some pretty good success. Did some sales around town uh, with a few different restaurants, uh, worked with a caterer and a few other places for outlets. Uh, that went really well. Um, I had gotten more into the organic side of things at that point. I was not onto foliar feeds, trace mineral nutrition and that sort of stuff. But I was onto the organic thing. I had completely abandoned uh, Roundup and chemical fertilizers and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I found that uh, when I took over that new plot and I put down all sorts of horse manure and uh, uh, guanos and all sorts of organic amendments, things really blew up there. Um, I will try and include some pictures of that maybe here or uh, you can go back and look on my channel for the, uh, the old farm tour. Uh, 2009 old farm tour I think is the title of the video maybe I'll dig up a link for that too or uh, or just do a search on my channel in my channel for uh, old farm tour and you'll find it um, so things blew up there uh, I still did not know about foliar feeds or trace mineral nutrition and didn't really understand the role of biology I knew that biology was a critical part of it but I didn't understand a lot of the more subtle parts of that I am still learning a huge learning curve on that and probably will continue to do so the rest of my life. Um, but I've, I've gained a tremendous amount of understanding and most of that understanding has come through uh, the Bionutrient Food Organization with Dan Kittredge out of uh, Massachusetts and NOFA, the Northeastern Organic Farmers Association, which is uh, obviously for the Northeastern United States. It's an organic... Uh, sort of a network and uh, they do they put on a soil nutrition conference every every uh, well every winter they put on a soil nutrition conference that is always excellent information you can always go back and download those conferences in audio form on bionutrient.org uh, go under library and you'll see those conferences and so from those conferences I came across John Kempf and when I came across John Kempf and I heard him speak at the 2013 Soil Nutrition Conference put on by Northeastern Organic Farmers Association and the Bionutrient Food Organization, that's when things really clicked for me. And that's when I realized just how important nutrition really was and why some of those pieces were so important. And John talked for, uh, I don't know, I think several hours out of that conference and he provided tremendous insight and perspective. And that's where I, I really made a giant paradigm shift. I started paying a lot more attention to my diet and what I was eating and what was going into my diet. And since then, my uh, passion for nutrition and health has grown tremendously. And I've come to realize a lot of the, uh, the actual physical health benefits and the effects that those have on people. And uh, not just people, but all plants, animals, and humans require certain enzymes and trace minerals and certain biology to be present in order, thing, in order for things to function correctly. And if those pieces aren't present, things don't function correctly. And if you know anything about endocrine systems, they are very sensitive. As you unbalance one part of an endocrine system, you, you disrupt the balance of the entire system. And so when you look at living systems, you always have to look at living systems as a system, as a system, as a whole. And those are words that I got from John Kempf. 
And so uh, I want to jump into some stuff from John Kemp's book, Quality Agriculture. This is volume one. I'm sure John will be writing a lot more volumes in the future as we go forward. But I wanted to share a little bit of perspective for you on that. So what I'm going to do first here is read the introduction from this book as I think it kind of puts what I'm talking about into a little bit better perspective for you. And then I'll go through and I'll dig out a few excerpts from this book because there's some really excellent information here and I just kind of want to introduce people to uh, why I talk about this and why I talk about John Kempf with such high regard and respect. So, introduction. Mainstream agron agronomy is based on a series of fallacies that plants absorb nutrients in the form of soluble ions that mites, nematodes, insects, fungi, bacteria, and viruses attack plants indiscriminately, that pesticides are effective long-term solutions. All of these commonly held ideas are false. Present-day mainstream agronomy and plant nutrition is based on the disproven idea that soil chemistry balance is the only parameter worth measuring and managing. This has led farmers to buying fertilizers that their crops don't need. <coughs> thereby supplying excessive imbalanced nutrition. This results in increased pest susceptibility and increased need for pesticide applications to prevent diseases and insects from consuming the now unhealthy crops. Because of this chemistry-based approach to crop production, with little consideration for soil biology, farmers are led to purchase inputs they don't need with money they often don't have because their advertisers claim they need them to remain competitive. Combined with the singular emphasis on high yields as the only meaningful metric of success, with little thought of crop quality, this approach often results in food and feed crops of questionable nutritional integrity. Due to this mindset, our soil's natural fertility has been greatly reduced. Weeds have become more difficult to control. Pest pressure has increased. More pesticide applications are required. And the nutritional quality of many foods has dropped. Many growers with a few decades of experience know this to be true because they observe in their, in their own operations. They have observed how pest pressure and crop performance have changed. They are certain there has to be a different way, a better way, but they are unclear where to begin. For many growers, the mainstream approach is all they have ever learned. It's all they know. But they also know now is the time to change. We have the knowledge, we now have the knowledge and information to make better choices. This book is intended to showcase the in-depth knowledge and wisdom that is available to growers today. Information that wasn't as easily available even a decade ago. It is a collection of interviews that I conducted with some of the most knowledgeable and influential voices in the regenerative agriculture today. As the host of Regenerative Agricultural Podcast, I have been privileged to ask the questions I'm personally curious about knowing that many others share my desire to learn. I have been asked many times to put together written resources from the work I've done over the years as a consultant. Providing the words of my mentors and colleagues in this field seem like the best way to start doing this. The voices in this book discuss the large and growing body of knowledge about agroecology. Most of them, including Tom Dykstra, Michael McNeil, and Jerry Hatfield, discuss how to manage nutrition to produce disease and insect-resistant crops. Gabe Brown and Chris Nichols talk about the negative effects of chemical fertilizers and how the biological diversity, both below the surface and above, are key for healthy farms. Gary Zibbert, Robert Kremer, and Jonathan Lundgren consider how to greatly reduce or eliminate the need for pesticides and how to increase crop yields while simultaneously increasing quality, regenerating soil health, and reducing fertilizer inputs. Gerald Pollock shares how structured water rapidly transports nutrients and molecules through plants. Chili grower Ed Curie discusses his passion for open pollinated seed breeding. Matt Kleinheins describes why nutritional integrity and density matters. And the legendary Don Huber delves deep into the important disease suppressive effects of the crop prior to a cash crop. The knowledge of each of these pioneers is invaluable. Their ideas will surely be adopted on a large scale around the globe as economic benefits of regenerative agriculture become realized. More than even its economic benefits, regenerative growing methods are vital because they return joy to our work. Farming becomes fun again when, we're, when we work with natural systems instead of working against them. When we experience the benefits of working with biological systems and robustly healthy plants, it quickly becomes obvious that we need less fertilizer. 
Once we have the assurance of personal experience that our crops are not susceptible, we don't need to worry about possible diseases or insects. And of course, when input costs are reduced while yield and quality are increased, the improved prof profitability provides a foundation to make all of farming fun again. Farming can only be successful lifestyle if it's first successful business. The, subjects, the subjects of this book reiterate these relevations over and over and over. As an, as an agronomy advisor working with advancing eco agriculture team, I have been privileged to help develop regenerative management systems on hundreds of thousands of acres and to observe the large untapped pot potential that exists on many farms. I am passionate about developing regenerative agricultural systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce food of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I have been blessed to have exceptional mentors. I discovered that there are many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems and how to develop regenerative agricultural systems. However, much of this knowledge is scattered and not widely known. It's found all over the place. A little bit of it has been published, published in peer-reviewed publications, but there are many incredible stories and a lot of knowledge that has not been published or shared with many people. So for those who don't know, we're streaming not just on YouTube, but also on Truth Frequency Radio. And so uh, the reason that we take the breaks is to stay uh, in sync with Truth Frequency Radio and, uh, and not have to uh, pump commercials at you here on YouTube. Um, but if you're listening on Truth Frequency Radio, You'll be hearing the commercials. Those commercials help support our station and keep us live. All right, so we're just going to jump off to the break here quickly. You're listening to Comrades and Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, TalkStream Live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, as in let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. We'll see you on the other side of the break. here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, Talk Stream Live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, as in let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. Before the break, I was reading an introduction from John Kemp's book 
Quality Agriculture, Volume 1. Uh, I'm going to finish reading that introduction, and then we'll jump into some other sections. I started AEA in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more cohesive fashion, a more coherent fashion, incorporating into its products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agricultural systems become adopted globally and become the mainstream, the status quo against which all other growing systems are compared. To help achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned over the last 14 years and make it available to everyone. While AEA has developed products that embody principles of regenerative agricultural systems and made them easier for growers to apply, this knowledge and these principles can be applied anywhere. When they are applied properly, they will always increase farm profitability and resilience to climate stress. These interviews are inspirational to me, and I'm confident they, they will be to you as well. My hope is this, that this book will give you a very diff different perspective on how to think about agronomy and crop production. I'm confident it will provide many ideas that you can easily implement in your operation. When you find the information in this book valuable, please share it with others, leave a review, and let others know what you find useful. The views and contents of my parts of these interviews, including any unintentional errors, are mine alone, and the same holds for subjects. Each conversation has been edited for clarity and length. Okay, so that's the introduction, and uh, I just want to kind of put all of this in perspective a little bit better, and uh, I'm going to go through and pick out some ex excerpts from this book to share with you, and I may elaborate my thoughts and ideas or experience on those. Okay, so I read you the introduction and shared that with you. I hope that kind of puts the uh, context and concepts in perspective for you. Uh, now I'm going to read uh, s an excerpt from the first chapter of this book, Developing Disease Resistance and Regenerating Soil Health, where John interviewed a man named Michael McNeil. Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. I don't want to give away John's entire book, but I do want to share a little bit of insight into why I'm so... Uh, adamant about nutrition and biology and how genetics and epigenetics are a tremendous factor in plant, animal, and human health. So Michael McNeil, I've had the fortune to see that old, old kind of farming and I see perhaps a need to return to a portion of what my grandfather was doing back in those days. I don't necessarily mean that we've got to sell our tractors and buy horses, but some of the things he did to improve soil health and to maintain soil fertility are things that we really need to be thinking about today. Some tillage is not as bad as herbicides, not as bad as anhydrous ammonia, and not as bad as the high salt fertilizers. They tend to be more of an issue. When you put them all together, it overwhelms the soil life system. Micronutrients are extremely important to plant growth. They are readily and easily chelated by the pesticides that we use, and once you tie them up, you start shutting down significant pathways. Disease and insects are Mother Nature's garbage collectors getting rid of bad stuff, the weak plants. I believe that the soil can grow an extremely healthy, high-yielding plant with minimal, minimal additions of inputs. There are plenty of minerals in the soil if you treat it properly. Stop poisoning the soil. Michael McNeil is one of the wise elders of agriculture. Born and raised in Iowa, he witnessed the transition into conventional chemical agriculture its wide-scale adoption and subsequent problems, and more recently, the advent of more regenerative growing methods. Michael has a very impressive background in agronomy, with degrees in plant physiology and statistical genetics. He earned his PhD from Iowa State University and worked for several years as a plant pathologist for the U.S. Army. He has a very long and successful career in the Midwest, serving as a plant breeder and research station director. Michael founded Ag Advisory Limited in 1983 and today he continues to work as a crop consultant, helping growers face a broad range of different challenges. So I'm going to read just a brief excerpt from John's interview with him. Um, again, I don't want to give away John's whole book. I just want to give you a taste of uh, some of the background of my understanding of nutrition, genetics, epigenetics, plant health, soil health, plant, animal, and human health, and how all those pieces tied together and why I'm so adamant about it. So. This is great because Michael is a well-versed, uh, <laughs> well-experienced person who has a lot of different degrees in specifically stuff like plant physiology and plant nutrition. So, John says, Michael, 
Can you begin by telling us a little bit about your background and the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis on your operation? Michael says, I was born and raised on a farm in northwest of Algona, Iowa, and I'm still farming here today. I've watched it go from horse-drawn equipment to our modern-day tractors that are GPS-guided across the field. It's been quite a transition that I've gotten to see, and I've learned a lot along the way. I've had the fortune to see the, the old kind of farming, and I see, perhaps, a need to return to a portion of what my grandfather was doing back in those days. I don't necessarily mean that we've got to sell our tractors and buy horses, but some, things, some of the things that he did to improve soil health and to maintain soil fertility are things that we really need to be thinking about today. In the past couple years, I've decided to go totally organic on our farm, which makes it a bit unusual, but somewhat commonplace for our community. There are about 42,000 areas of organic crops in the two county area here where I live. 42,000 acres, I'm sorry. John says, wow, that's grown quite substantially. And Michael says, it's a huge change. This is a sort of, there is sort of a stigma when you talk about organic farmers. Many times, folks think of the guy that's farming the 20 or 40 acre patch that's covered with weeds. But the farmers in our community that we're working with range all the way from the half, se from a half section, 320 acres of land, to 15,000 acres. Those farms are pretty much weed free. They're excellent farmers. They've learned a lot about weed management, weed control, soil fertility, and soil health. I'm pretty excited to see that change, but it does remind me a bit of the things that my grandfather taught me years ago, the way he took care of crops. John, can you tell us a little bit about your professional work? What do you do professionally in addition to the farming operation? Michael says, well, I left the farm for a few years and got my formal education at Iowa State University, where I majored in, in agronomy. I got my BS degree in soils and soil fertility, and then I became quite interested in how soil impacted plant growth. I have my master's degree in plant physiology. Then I was intrigued with how genetics work and how the environment impacted genetics, so I ended up getting my PhD in quantitative genetics. Along that same path, I also became interested in plant diseases and got a minor in plant pathology. After leaving the university, I spent some time at a facility in Frederick, Maryland, where we studied the impact of diseases that could be used as weapons and how we could defend our crops against that type of thing. I learned a great deal about how fertility and genetics can create an environment that, that can allow us to protect ourselves from any pathogenic invasion. John says, that sounds intriguing. Where did that lead you? Michael says, I became a corn breeder and I worked for a major company for 12 years managing a corn breeder research station. I started their soybean be breeding program as well as continuing it in the corn breeding project. During that time, farmers, asked me, farmers would ask me more fertility and soil fertility questions than they would genetic questions. I kept trying to explain how the two worked together. That was about the time GMOs were invented. We were using gene guns and blasting gold dust through the genes and trying to move them from one organism into another. We started taking genes out of different species and moving them around, taking genes out of bacteria and putting them into a corn plant. This really didn't sit well with my thoughts about how our species were created and why. Who is man to mess with that? We were opening a Pandora's box to who knows what when we started doing this. I chose to step out of that type of breeding work, sticking mainly with my quantitative genetics approach versus the gene approach. I chose to mo work more with soil health, soil fertility, and genotype by fertility interactions. That led me into a profession of agricultural consulting. I started working with farmers and explained how all this worked and it got to be a pretty exciting adventure. I started with a farmer. He had 160 acres, and then his neighbor added another 160 to it. And now I'm up to 165,000 acres that I work on. That's sort of a history of how, to, how I got to where I am today. I'm going to leave off from that section at this point, because, again, I don't want to share the whole book with you. I just want to share pieces of it. But that should give you a little bit of insight into the type of people that are doing regenerative agriculture and that they're not uh, closed-minded, stupid people or people who don't understand soil health or plant health or human health. These are people who understand it on a really deep level. I mean, this guy's got a degree in quantitative genetics. You know, it's not like he just uh, pulled this out of his uh, hat. He, uh, he really does understand things on a very intimate level. So that's Michael, and uh, we'll go on to another excerpt here in just a moment. Okay, so this next excerpt, excerpt is from the next chapter in this book. It's called Suppressing D Disease for Future Crops. This is uh, Don Huber interview. 
Manganese has a very dynamic relationship with the soil and also with many of the fungi. There are organisms, mycorrhizae, that increase the uptake of manganese, as well as zinc and phosphorus and some of the other nutrients. If they're not functional, you miss that ability to absorb and interact with the tremendous volume of the soil. When we're farming, we're really managing an ecology. It's not a matter of a silver bullet for the problem or a sting mi stinger missile for another. It's really a matter of having ecology work for us and support the plant. If we don't do that, we upset the system, and then we compromise the overall quality and productivity potential we have in our soil. Crop rotation probably has the most dynamic effect on the soil microbial population. We can do that primarily through crop sequencing. The crop that immediately precedes your target crop is to provide about 85% of the overall disease suppressing effect. We can accomplish that with cover cropping. By learning what your soil is, what your biology is, you can control most diseases through management, unless you're doing something that is very detrimental or has long term effects on biology. If you increase carbon dioxide just a small amount, it'll have an exponential increase in photosynthesis. It's critical that we recognize the stewardship that we have when it comes to the soil and our own survivability, rather than just accepting the changes and saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it now. There's a tremendous amount we can do. It's a matter of understanding what we're managing, that we're managing an ecology. How much of an effect does crop rotation really have? According to Dr. Don Huber, 85% of disease suppression is a result of the crop that was planted prior to a cash crop. Don shares this and many other fascinating insights in this interview. Don is a professor of emeterius, professor emeterius of plant pathology at Purdue University. After receiving his PhD at Michigan State University, Don worked for several years for the Army, retiring in 1995 as a colonel after 41 years of active and reserve service. He joined the faculty of Purdue in 1971. He has authored or co-authored hundreds of papers, presentations, and other publications, including co-editing Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, one of the key texts on plant health. Don has had an extraordinary life. He has contributed a great deal to our collective knowledge of plant pathology, developing disease-suppressive soils and the possible long-term impacts of herbicides and pesticides. So again, I'll read just a little bit of this interview uh, to just kind of draw you in a little bit and uh, give you a little bit of insight and understanding. Don, uh, John says, Don, you've had some very rich life experiences. What are some of the memorable, mom memorable moments that have led you to where you are today? Don says, I just have fun wherever I am. At any particular time, you have a few challenges, but those help you grow and help you focus on what you really want to do or how you think you can be of greater service. John says, what was something in your research that work that puzzled that you puzzled over for a really long time that you struggled to figure out Don says there have been a number of them when you study soil ecology you're looking at a black box the pieces to the puzzle come a little slower than they might for some other programs or other areas but you start working on the border and then you start filling in the center as the puzzle builds you get a little better picture of, of all the dynamics that are involved I think that the greatest challenge is to gain some comprehension of what the black box really is doing. It's a dynamic nature and its critical importance of the overall production scheme. John says, what has been something that surprised you? Don says, how about uh, how everything can be working at one time but, not, but seem to be so contradictory? John says, can you give an example of that? Don says, a lot of your nutrient relationships we have microorganisms that are responsible for changing the valence states of various minerals so that they're more available or less available. You have those going on in both directions at the same time in some capacities. It's an issue with manganese or iron this, or some of those things. Some of the secondary functions come into play so that all of that can take place and manifest in a very positive manner. Even though what you might be looking at or the test that you have may not show a complete picture, you have to realize that it has to be going on in order to complete the cycle. It's a matter of either developing the techniques or understanding how all of those organisms interact, the ecological niches that make the system work. Everything isn't just one big pool with somebody stirring the whole thing around. You really have a community of functions that are taking place at the same time, but you don't have the same gas station at every corner or a grocery store at every corner. You, don't, you have each one of these different functions taking place in its own little scheme of things. The overall system is a very functional and very dynamic relationship relative to the plan. It's neat. 
John says, one of the pieces that you and I have discussed in the past is the challenge that we are seeing today with manganese availability. I would say that as much as 80% or more, perhaps even 90% or more of the crops that we work with today come back showing in inadequate levels of manganese. What are the major factors that contribute to that? Don says, manganese has a very dynamic relationship with the soil and also with many of the fungi. There are organisms, mycorrhizae, that increase the uptake of manganese, manganese as well as zinc and phosphorus and some of the other nutrients. If they're not functional, you miss the ability to absorb that and to interact with the tremendous volume of the soil, where that mineral might be in short supply. The other thing is you have bacteria that are responsible for the valence state. You have, uh, you have the oxidizing groups. You have the reducing groups. The plant can utilize only the reduced form of manganese, the MN2 plus form. MN plus 4 form is not available, but we see it primarily in soils that have high phosphate levels or high oxidative relationships. The manganese can be there and yet not be available for uptake. We see it with, with many of our pathogens because the pathogens utilize manganese oxidants as a virulence factor. We looked at several thousand islets of Guanamyces graminis, which causes take all, which causes take all all over the world. We evaluated those and we found that, that there was one characteristic that was common in all virulent forms, manganese oxidation. If the wheat had oxidized manganese, it would never resist the disease. The same thing for rice blast. The same thing for isolates of Stemosuces scabies, pardon my pronunciation, and a number of other pathogens. The ability to oxidize manganese to a non-available form and to compromise the resistance of the plant to those pathogens. And if, patho if the pathogens can't bring about that com compromising of the availability of manganese by converting it into an oxidized form, the fungus is essentially just a good saprophyte in the soil. In other words, it serves a beneficial function instead of a detrimental function in the soil. Same thing with many bacteria. We see these direct effects on mineral availability be involved not just in growth and quality of the nutrient density, but also in susceptibility or resistance to, to disease. You have the virulence relationship of the pathogens with bacteria and fungi in the soil, and that's related to those minerals that are necessary for the plant's defenses. These minerals are also directly related to the growth and resistance of the plants to those pathogens in their overall physiological function. It all fits together very nicely if the system is, is balanced, if it's favorable. That's one of the things that we can adapt to. When we're farming, we're really managing an ecology. It's not a matter of a silver bullet for this problem, or a stinger missile for another. It's really a matter of having ecology work for us and support the plant. If we can't do that, and we upset the system, then we compromise the overall quality and productivity potential we have in our soil. John says, you said that there are a number of pathogens that are dependent on manganese oxidation. If they're unable to oxidize manganese, they just become saprophytes in the soil profile. Are they dependent on the manganese oxidation directly? Do they individually require it, or are they just producing a manganese deficient plant that is now susceptible to invasion? And Don answers, both of these statements would be correct. They don't necessarily need the oxidation. Some of them are also reducing organisms. In other words, if you change the environment, or if you change the association that they have with other organisms, then they may be strong reducing versus strong oxidizing organisms. We see that especially with the pseudo, pseudo pseudomonads and a number of other organisms. You can change the soil environment and they can benefit you or they can be synergistic or they can even be a direct pathogen involved in compromising that resistance. The microorganisms use those minerals just like a plant does or just like we do. Our metallonutrients or strong transition elements of electron transfer and physiological processes are the cofactors for enzyme function. We don't require very much of them but if you don't have that specific cofactor that's involved for an enzyme, that enzyme isn't going to do any work for you. It's just another protein that's sitting there. About 80% of our proteins in plants are what we call metal metalloproteins, where the metallo part is a cofactor. It's a small part, but a very critical one. One far as function, uh, one, as far as function of the physiological pathway. So I'm going to cut off there again. I don't want to share the whole book, but I do want to share uh, some insights to it. So when I'm talking about enzymes and trace mineral nutrition and how those are critical, those enzyme cofactors, uh, not all of them are metals. Some of them are other uh, trace minerals. But yeah, do you see what I mean when I say how critical those little pieces are? You don't need a lot of them, 
but they have to be there. They have to be in the right oxidation state. They have to be plugged into an appropriate bi biological system. And so what we're really trying to do is study and mimic nature here. If we can find how the natural systems work and study them and mimic that in our farming systems, we can sort of uh, make this transition much easier and not have to be focused on each of these little processes. Now, remember, these are just very small pieces of these processes, right? This is just like one part. This is like, we're just talking about manganese here, right? But, you know, plants have it, use at least 90 different minerals, right? And so if you were to take that and look at each of those minerals individually and try to balance each of those 90 things individually in their correct oxidation state and micromanage each of those pieces, how successful do you think you'd really be? It would be an incredibly difficult task to accomplish. So that's why I make this point and that's why I read this excerpt because I felt it was really important. And it goes back to conserving, uh, conserving ecology, not doing things that are detrimental to the biological system either in the soil or on the plant. I should mention along the way that uh, I did some um, plant sap analysis tests, uh, was it last year? No, year before last. I did plant sap analysis tests on my tomatoes just to kind of see where I was at. For those who don't know, plant sap analysis is an excellent way to see what's actually happening in the plant. And that gives you a really good indication of how well the plant is interacting with the soil biology, what nutrients are actually being taken up, how effective your foliar feeds are, and on down the list. It's sort of a snapshot at exactly where the plant's health is at the time you take the sample, which is very different from taking a soil sample. Uh, oftentimes, even if, uh, you know, like, even, like manganese, for example, you could have adequate manganese in the soil, but if they're not in the right oxidation state, it's not going to do you any good anyway. And so that's why plant sap analysis is a great, um, a great tool for understanding where your plants are at. So I did that and I found I was low in manganese, copper, zinc, and boron. And interestingly enough, if you go back and look at the uh, uh, bio biochemical sequence of plant, of nutrition in plants, you'll see that those are very critical elements just for photosynthesis and plant health and cell growth to happen. So if you're missing those pieces, you're missing a huge part of it. So I took those that test last year and then this year I ordered those nutrients uh, in a foliar feed form from Advancing Eco Agriculture and I made a point of including those in my foliar feeds and I can tell you the growth response, the yield response, and the quality response is just astounding. Just correcting those nutrients on that little level made a tremendous difference in my soil health, in my plant health, and in my overall growth on my farm here. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of insight that ties into that and uh, just kind of uh, bring all these pieces back together for you as we go along here in the show. Okay, so uh, I've talked about all various different pieces of agriculture. I talked a little bit about why uh, we tie all these pieces together, whether it's uh, uh, computers, code, technology, the future, data science. You can see why I hope now you can have a little perspective and see why all these pieces tie together and why they're relevant for comrades and farms. Uh, I don't want my show to just be about a very small section of agriculture or farming or gardening. I really want to cover a very broad range of topics and open uh, minds and perspectives uh, to the level that I see things on at least or hopefully a way above and beyond my level uh, if I could if I could be the facilitator um, or, or the piece of the puzzle that puts someone else into a, an even deeper level of knowledge than me and to go forward and to build a better future for us in our food systems, I would be very honored for that to be the case. Um, so anyway, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about those different pieces. I wanted to uh, share some excerpts from John Kemp's book. I'm very much looking forward to having John as, on as a guest. Uh, like I said, he's a wealth of knowledge, and uh, you can see just from the little bit that I've read from his book that he has a very different perspective on agriculture than the conventional systems that we have in place today. And John and myself and Dan Kittredge and Don Huber and so many other people uh, are all working toward building a better future and building, uh, building regenerative agriculture to be the mainstream thing in the future. And I, you know, the prediction is it's going to take about 20 years. 
Um, I've already seen a few years uh, transition time on that and I think it might even be less than 20 years. It's really catching fire and people are really starting to uh, get excited about it, share it with others, learn about it. There's more information coming out every day and every year on it and there's lots more research ongoing and lots more minds connecting and sharing on these levels. Um, so I hope you find this interesting and informative and helpful. Uh, I'd love to hear any feedback you might have about it. Don't be afraid to do so in the chat or down in the comments section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and insights um, or your questions even. And uh, if you have questions, I'd be glad to address them in future shows. So don't be afraid to, uh, to uh, comment on that. So for the last part of the show here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you my plant sap analysis test results. I did a video on this uh, last year, the year before. I forget when it was now. Time is kind of a blur. But uh, I'm going to share that video with you for the last part of the show to give you a little bit more insight on plant sap analysis, how it works, what my results were, and some of the actions that uh, I had planned to take from those. And then, of course, if you go back and look at uh, this last year's growth season 2020, you'll see a lot of the results from that. So I hope you find this interesting or informative, um, and I hope you enjoy this last part of the show. Uh, with that, we're going to go to the break. We'll catch you on the other side. You're listening to Comrades in Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, Talk Stream Live, and the Pharmacy Seeds Network. <laughs> here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, Talk Stream Live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, as in let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. Hi folks, Carlton from the Pharmacy Seeds Network here. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, plant sap analysis today. Uh, I talk a lot about building soils, regenerative agriculture, organic versus standard uh, organic versus certified organic and a lot of the uh, issues and problems that we have with the current agricultural system uh, a lot of the certified organic stuff uh, doesn't require testing of the produce it only requires certain parameters be filled like for example 
you can't spray chemicals for three years on a piece of land and then you can get certified organic on it. And the reality is those chemicals have much longer half-lives. Anyway, I don't want to get off all into a whole bunch of other stuff right now. This video is about plant sap analysis. All that information that I was just discussing really brings me back to we need to be doing testing on our plants, on our soils, and really verify what our quality is, what our nutrition is, and verify when we have deficiencies and address them and correct them. And so that's what this video is about. I had a plant sap analysis done on these beefsteak tomatoes here. Let's see if I can show you those. I'm not used to working with the camera in reverse. Anyway, I had a plant sap analysis done. I took a plant sap sample and I sent it into Advancing Eco Agriculture. And they sent it to the lab in the Netherlands to be analyzed. And I got those plant sap analysis results back. And I want to go over those with you. Um, but I just want to uh, discuss a few things before we did that. And really it comes down to uh, using good testing. Um, you can do plant uh, mineral assays, which is a dried plant matter test, uh, but that doesn't, uh, doesn't yield the same results and it isn't as accurate. So that's why we use plant sap testing. Uh, now that said, on a scale as small as I am, I would not recommend you use plant sap testing uh, if you're doing it for economic reasons. Because uh, John Kemp from AEA says any crop under $5,000 uh, the plant sap analysis uh, with corrections isn't going to be enough to compensate for that financial loss that you spent on the plant sap. So I'll just say it, the plant sap test costs about 65 bucks, so it's not an inexpensive test to do. Uh, but I wanted to do it to under, better understand my growing practices, how well my foliar feeds are targeted, and to adjust those foliar feeds and make them better for next year. Really, plant sap analysis tests should be done every two weeks, and then that gives you a way to calibrate where you were, where you are, where you're going, and whether or not what you're doing has an effect. Obviously, I don't have the budget to do this every two weeks. I just wanted to have a better understanding here. So I spoke with Nathan from AEA on Friday, and we went over my plant sap analysis test, and I got a lot of excellent information out of that. I'm going to do a full year feed. I don't know if I'll get to it tonight. We're supposed to have rain coming tomorrow, so I may hold off till Tuesday for this, which is a little late. Uh, I should have done my foliar feed Friday, but I didn't, I didn't get to it. It's been a crazy week. Anyway, what we're going to do now is go inside. I'll pull up that plant sap analysis test, and we'll go over it in a little more detail. I hope you find this interesting, and uh, I hope this helps someone. Okay, so <laughs> the earlier part of this video was filmed on September 1st, 2019. It is now December 4th, 2019. But uh, we're going to take a look through the plant sap analysis results that I received back from AEA and from Nova Crop Control. Um, unfortunately, there was a hang up on my sap analysis and I didn't get it back for a little bit longer than I should have. Um, this happens very rarely, occasionally, with Nova Crop Science. and. Uh, uh, Nathan and the people of AEA apologize profusely for it. and it is really kind of okay because like I said I'm not testing every two weeks and so it's not quite as critical. Anyway, it's something that could happen so be aware that it could happen uh, and don't take it personally if it does if you do do plant sap analysis. That said, let's get on with it. So this plant sap analysis, plant sap analysis, I guess I should explain how plant sap analysis works. We take two samples off of the leaves. We take a young sample and an old sample. And uh, so when you order your plant sap analysis kit, they send you uh, collection bags and a procedure for collecting and a way to, uh, it's crop specific, I should say, and a way to determine uh, the young leaf from the old leaf. Um, it's not quite what you would expect. I'm pretty intimately familiar with tomato plants and young and old leaves, and I was surprised uh, just how subtle the differences are between old and long, old and young leaves. But um, anyway, so you take a whole bag sample, it's about a quart sample of young leaf, and you take about a quart sample of older leaf, about two weeks old. And so you send the, these two samples into the lab, and what they do is they take, they extract the sap from the plant 
from the leaf matter that you send. They extract that sap and they analyze the sap for its actual nutritional components. As opposed, this is different from um, uh, mineral analysis where they dry the plant matter and they burn it and they do gas, chroma chro gas chromatography on it. I believe that's how they do the dry sample matters. And so um, it's once again, like anything else in science, as things evolve here, we're starting to realize that you can't just look at something outside of the living system. If you really want to understand what's going on in the living system, you really have to look at it in the system as it's functioning in the system. And obviously, because we're trying to look inside of living systems, that's very difficult to do. Fortunately for plants, we can cut off some leaves and take blood samples from them. Uh, there's a whole other thing, uh, maybe I'll go into this at some point, um, about the difference between dry blood samples and live blood samples. They use something called a somatoscope to look at live blood samples. And there is a tremendous difference between those two as well. But for now, we're going to stay focused on plants and plant sap analysis. So um, what I'll do here uh, is I'll put up the first part of this. Uh, I, had to sp I had to split this into two parts so you could see it in the video. So I got the top part of the chart and the bottom part of the chart. So we'll look at the top part first. And if you look at the, uh, at the chart, <laughs> if you look at the lines next to the chart, that gives you an indication of uh, where you're at. So <coughs> for example, uh, we'll just start at the top of the chart, uh, chart total sugars. Uh, optimum would be 0.7 to 2.1, and if you look, our current level is 0.5 and 0.3, so our sugars were low. Now that's kind of indicative, that kind of ties into the bricks meter thing. Um, I'm not going to go into great depth in that right now because I don't want to get sidetracked. Uh, you'll notice the pH. Uh, this is a really good indicator. Plants whose plant sap pH is at 6.4 can neither be attacked by insects nor attacked by fungi and other uh, you know, bacteria and those sort of things. If you go above or below, those attack probabilities increase dramatically. So you notice that um, optimum is 6.2 to 6.6. .6. You'll notice my current levels are 4.8 and 4.8. So that's not good. Uh, let's see, we'll go down to EC. Actually, we'll just skip EC because that's not super important. Uh, EC, for those who don't know, is electrical conductivity. Uh, we'll look at potassium. You'll notice my potassium levels are uh, just about where they need to be. I suppose I should mention at this point that I also had been doing foliar feeds. About two weeks prior to taking the plant sap analysis, I stopped foliar feeding because I did not want to uh, I didn't want to mess up the results of the plant sap analysis. I wanted to get a real accurate baseline for what I'm doing and what my soil is actually doing and how my plants are interacting with the soil. Because that is the true value of plant sap analysis is really, you know, what are the plants actually doing? All right, so my potassium levels are good and I'm supplementing potassium in these foliar feeds. So that's a good sign. That means I'm able to target potassium pretty close. You'll notice that optimum is 3393 to 4407 and we're sitting at 4904 and 4890. I'm actually a hair heavy on potassium. However, if we go down to the next column, you see calcium. You'll notice that my calcium levels are significantly low. This is a huge factor. Calcium is a big part of the uh, biochemical sequence. Maybe I'll stick a shot of the biochemical sequence of nutrition in plants here, right here, so you can have a better understanding of how calcium and all these other uh, nutrients interact inside the plant in the biochemical sequence of nutrition. The biochemical sequence of nutrition is basically like you have to have one, one, um, one nutrient so you can build to the next nutrient and bridge to the next and bridge to the next. And so if any one of those is low, you don't have enough to bridge the whole thing over and so you lose parts of that cycle and therefore obviously lose efficiency tremendously. All right, we'll roll down to magnesium here. You'll notice my magnesium levels are actually a hair high, um, but I think we'll find out when we go over to the next chart, part two here, which I'll bring up now for you, you'll see that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at how that interacts. We'll go on down to sodium next here. You'll notice my sodium levels 
All right, so we'll go down to sodium next here. So you notice my optimum levels for sodium would be 28 to 62. Mine are a little low at 18 and 23. Uh, on, on the left-hand side, what my actual levels are, those are old and new. Uh, if you look at the key in the top of the first chart, you'll see the old and new plant sap tests. So we're comparing old versus new and looking at, you know, have we gone up, have we gone down? Basically, what direction are we going? We're going to ignore NH4 ammonium for now. Um, it's just not, uh, we're just not going to go into all the super complexities of plant nutrition. Um, probably not that well versed yet. Uh, we'll go down to nitrate though, take a look at that. You'll see the optimum will be 70 to 210. You'll notice my nitrogen levels are way high and you'll see why as we go down this chart further. So notice my calcium levels are low, my nitrogen levels are high. Um, so we, we obviously have some imbalances here. Let's see, that was NO3 nitrate, and this is N in nitrate. It uh, should be 16 to 47. Again, they're very high, 48 and 78. We'll go down to total nitrogen now. This is a, there's many different types of nitrogen in plants. I'm not going to go into specific details on that at the moment. Um, but uh, you'll see that we at total nitrogen, we should be 1147 to 1552 and you'll see that we're at 1665 and 1570 respectively. So we're a little high, um, but not horribly high, but, but definitely out of range. Um, chloride levels uh, should be 620 to 1230. We're in a pretty optimal range for chloride. Sulfur, sulfur is a critical one, and this, this, this ties into the calcium as well as the high nitrate levels. So let's look at sulfur. Sulfur should be 1235 to 2015, and we're at 718 and 1029. Uh, <laughs> we're way low on sulfur, and sulfur is uh, affects calcium and nitrogen and a lot of these enzyme and catalyst processes within the plant. Like I said, we'll go back to that in a bit. Phosphorus, let's look at phosphorus. So phosphorus should be 180 to 420, and I'm way, way, way high at 461 and 429. Um, let's see, silica should be 13.6 to 20.4, and I'm a little high on silica, 23.8 and 25.9. Those aren't too far off, and a little extra silica probably won't hurt you too bad. Now, iron. Iron plays a very important role in, um, in the synthesis of uh, chlorophyll. Um, I'd have to go back and look into that further, but I remember uh, specifically Nathan uh, mentioning that to me, and I know I've heard that in other AEA talks, iron is a very critical component in the synthesis of chlorophyll. So it's not actually part of the chlorophyll molecule, but it's important for creating chlorophyll within the plant. So let's look at that. 2.35 to 4.65, and my iron levels are way low at 1.55 and 1.21, horribly low. So that's not good. And that, of course, if you can't create enough chlorophyll, you can't accelerate photosynthesis. And if you can't accelerate photosynthesis, uh, no energy is created or transmitted within the plant to other cells. So um, this is a critical one. Remember, the whole system relies on photosynthesis. If photosynthesis efficiency is high, everything runs fine. You have to supply all the components to make that happen, but it really comes back to whether or not photosynthesis is good. And if, obviously, there's many reasons why photosynthesis could be up or down. And it all goes back to the trace mineral nutrition and the availability of trace minerals within the plant, within the plant sap, and so on and so forth. Let's roll on down to manganese. Manganese, uh, well, let's roll down to manganese, zinc, boron, copper, and molybdenum. Uh, these are very critical. Uh, I'll think I'll throw the uh, biochemical sequence of nutrition in plants back up again here so you can see how that these interact so critically in that sequence of nutrition within plants. And then we'll go back and we'll talk about it. Manganese. Manganese was 10, uh, Optima at 10.8 to 25. My manganese levels were 1189 and 1552. Uh, so not horribly low, but low enough that it's, it's on the bottom end of the scale and it really would be better to be in the, in the medium range. Zinc, uh, 2.1 to 4.9. You notice my zinc levels are low at 2.61 and 1.92. Uh, 
that definitely should be, basically my zinc level should be almost double what they were at the, when this test was taken. Uh, please remember plant sap tests are a snapshot of that specific time in the plant's life and it can change within hours, days, etc. Um, let's see, we'll go on down to boron. Boron should be 4.7 to 9.3. You'll notice my boron levels are also very low at 2.85 and 3.56. And copper, 2.5 to 7.5. My copper levels are critically, critically low at 1.12 and 0.94. And then let's go down to molybdenum. Uh, 0.25 to 0.75 <laughs> and look at mine are 0.08 and 0.05 so a big part of why my plants aren't growing as healthily as they should be and as productive as they should be are, are these critical components here manganese, zinc, boron, copper and molybdenum. molybdenum and please remember all along through the summer and from the very start of the season I've tried to ensure that these are present in and on the plant and in and on the soil in an available form as well as appropriate biology to support that. But even with my foliar feeds, even trying and thinking that I was on target, I was off. I was still low. So uh, this is where plant sap analysis really has its value. This is the only way to date scientifically to go back and confirm whether your foliar feeds are targeting specifically what they need to target and if they're not to find out what specifically you're not hitting and how to correct it. So I had a pretty good discussion with Nathan uh, after I got my plant sap analysis test back. I think we spent close to an hour on the phone. I, I kind of grilled him about it. I really asked him a lot of questions and he was really helpful and informative about it and I have a much better idea how to correct things for next year. Um, I, I may try and do a plant sap analysis test next year earlier in the season to correct it. Um, but going back to uh, all these pieces, let's take a look at the plant biochemicals, the biochemical sequence of nutrition in plants again, and let's discuss that. All right, so now let's look at the biochemical sequence of nutrition in plants because this is critical and important and it pertains directly to plant sap analysis and, and the synthesis of trace mineral nutrition and all nutrition in plants. So let's just go over it quick. If you look at the bi plant biochemical sequence, it starts with boron. So you can see already why boron and silicon and magnesium and some of these other compounds are so critical. Um, so the whole process begins with boron. So if you don't have boron present, you can't activate silicon, which carries all other nutrients, starting with calcium, which will bind nitrogen to form amino acids, DNA, and cell division. And so this ties in specifically to why my nitrogen levels are so high. My boron levels are low, my sulfur levels are low, and my calcium levels are low. You can't really bind nitrogen without enough calcium and you got to start that whole sequence with boron. So now you can start to see the picture of how this all comes together and why, why these things are so interactive with each other. So boron activates silicon, which carries all other nutrients, starting with calcium, which then binds nitrogen to form amino acids, DNA, and cell division. Then these amino acids form proteins such as chlorophyll and tag trace elements, especially magnesium, which is, is a big part of the chlorophyll molecule, um, which transfers energy via phosphorus to carbon to form sugars to go where potassium carries them. So you can see that even just being shy on boron, even if you had everything else balanced, that's a severe limiting factor in the photosynthetic process. So I just wanted to point this out and kind of help people understand a little bit how the biochemical sequence of nutrition in plants uh, relates to this topic and how important it is to have all of the trace elements present. And I realize in this bio biochemical sequence of nutrition in plants, we didn't go into manganese and copper and zinc and some of these other ones, but just understand that each, each trace element is the basis for an enzyme or, uh, or some other uh, chemical electrical process in the plant. And each one, if it is deficient, that enzyme can't function. If that enzyme can't function, then many other pieces of this puzzle can't operate. It's, uh, it's, a lot like, it's a lot like trying to take a train down the tracks, but you haven't finished building the tracks. Well, the train's not going to go very far when the tracks end. It's going to crash. And it's the same concept here. Um, 
I know that's kind of a brute force version of it, but um, I hope this helps people understand how important it is to have trace mineral nutrition in plants. Um, I feel like I've been bouncing my head off the wall talking about this for a number of years, and I, I haven't really been able to uh, to narrow it down and, and explain more what I mean. So I'm hoping this video will reach people and it'll help you understand just how much more efficiency you can have in your plants and how much more plant health you can have. Now, of course, uh, in addition to increasing photosynthesis, all the other good things that, that comes with that happens. Um, plant uh, secondary metabolites go up, uh, polyphenols, terpenes, terpenoids, flavonoids, all these medicinal plant compounds, those all go up tremendously when you get the health of the plant up and the photosynthetic engine, so to speak, up and running at full efficiency and capacity. And so uh, it also improves yield, it improves disease and insect resistance, it just really amplifies the whole thing. And basically, if you get a plant up to true health through trace mineral nutrition and biology and making sure that, that plant has everything it needs as much of the time during its life cycle as you can do it, um, you'll have much healthier plants, you won't have to fight diseases and pests, you won't need to use pesticides or at least you'll be able to reduce pesticide usage if you're a pesticide fan. Um, and so all these other benefits come with it. So this is why the plant sap analysis test makes so much sense. Um, that said, uh, the plant sap analysis test, I think I said earlier in this video, cost me $65. Um, it cost me another $72 to ship it to AEA, and then they shipped it to uh, the Netherlands for the actual lab work. So all total, it was about $140 to take this plant sap test, which is why John Kemp says, you know, if, if your crop value is less than $5,000, <coughs> doing plant sap analysis won't get you enough gain to offset, um, you know, to offset through yield uh, what you would lose in plant sap analysis testing and cost. Now that said, even on a small scale for me, this is a tremendous thing because I really understand what's going on in my soil now. And I can address some of these things through soil amendments as well as foliar feeds. One of the things I talked about with Nathan was like, man, my calcium levels are always low in this soil. We have a, a, a tight clay soil here. And over the years and different seasons, I've added calcium sulfate to improve that. And I've seen tremendous growth improvements in areas when I've done that. And, uh, and so I was asking him how to get calcium up. And he was saying that calcium sulfate is probably the best way to do that in the soil. Uh, I will share uh, a little bit more detail on that for you for those of you who have tight clay soils. Again, I can't speak for your specific soils. You should really have your own testing done and do testing specific to your plants and to your soils and to your growing processes so that you can really calibrate yourself. But he was saying that um, calcium sulfate would be an excellent thing. I should probably do three to four applications throughout the growing season in the soil, starting early season, and keeping in mind that calcium sulfate takes between 30 and 45 days to become available to the plants in the soil. It takes some, some time for the calcium sulfate to break down and the calcium and the sulfur in that to become available to the biology in the soil and consequently to the plants. Um, I think this pretty much covers everything I wanted to cover through this video. I hope you found this interesting and informative. I hope you'll like and subscribe. And if you have any questions, by all means, shoot them away down below. I'm glad to answer everything I can answer. And if I can't answer them, I'll, uh, I'll certainly be willing to go ask AEA or John Kempf or someone who is more knowledgeable than me and get you the answers you're looking for. Um, I highly recommend if you haven't checked out Advancing Ag Eco Agriculture's YouTube channel and their website, I highly recommend you check that out. I'll throw links below and uh, I'll just say uh, it's Advancing Eco Agriculture uh, on their YouTube channel and their website I believe is Advancing Eco Ag AdvancingEcoAgriculture.com I think. Um, anyway, these guys are uh, cutting edge of plant science and uh, I've I'm really appreciative and grateful for all their educational and knowledge tools and their support and for all their consultations. Thank you especially to Nathan Harmon and Robin Katowski. Uh, you guys have been really supportive and beneficial for my homesteading and farming operation here. I've learned so much from you. So thank you so much Advancing Eco Agriculture <coughs> and I look forward to hearing more from you guys in the future and I hope that everyone watching this video has found it informative and helpful and that you go check out these other links and run down more information so you have a better understanding of plant health also. Thanks for watching.
the Pharmacy Seeds Network. All right, so that was a rundown of my plant sap analysis. That is a separate video here on my channel. Uh, I just will give you the title to that briefly while we're here talking about it. It's, uh, it's from December 4th, 2019. It's called Plant Sap Analysis Results and Discussion. So uh, you can always check that uh, video out independently on my channel on YouTube. Um, I just want to say thank you for listening. I appreciate your uh, interest and uh, I appreciate that you return every week and listen to me talk and share your perspectives and thoughts. I appreciate all the people who uh, interact in the chat, the comments I receive on these, and uh, and all the support. It's uh, It means a lot. I hope you found this show interesting or informative. Thanks for listening to Comrades in Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, Talk Stream Live, and also on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, as in let food be thy medicine, medicine by thy food. Good night, everyone.
Thank <laughs> you.